Welcome to A Fighter's Life with me, Jordan Banjo, exclusive to Boxing Social on all platforms. Now, you can watch A Fighter's Life at www.boxing-social.tv every Sunday or just head over to the Boxing Social YouTube channel. Has there been a moment that sticks out for you, a mistake for you? I've messed this one up. Woke up two hours later to about 40 missed calls from Eddie. Eddie walks in behind me and just drops a letter down. And I open it and a final warning. Uh, welcome to A Fighter's Life, Mr. Frank Smith. How are you, bro? I'm good, mate. I'm good. I I've said a few times I'm not a fighter, but it's but, good to be here. No, mate. Listen, we're going to make it work. We're going to make it work. Like, <laughs> here on A Fighter's Life, right, it's not obviously just about fighters, like boxers, this and that. You are such an integral part of the sport. And I said, it was funny, we bumped into each other very, very briefly at um, Smith Bank 1. And it's like, as you're walking past... I do feel like boxing is probably one of the only sports where promoters, managers, trainers can be as famous as half the fighters there. Do you know what I mean? Like it's nuts. Like people like you have like genuine fans of you and this and that. Going, let's just jump right back, starting starting simply. Why boxing? How into boxing? I mean, I know you've said the story a few times about how you met Eddie and the sort yeah. of, but just walk us through for anyone who hasn't heard it before. To be honest, I met Eddie when I was... 14 years old. It was at Rumford Greyhound track. I was selling raffle tickets for a charity. And someone had said to me, oh, that geezer's got a Bentley outside. And I went, that tight bastard gave me <laughs> 20 quid. I was like, I'm selling raffle tickets for a charity here. He gave me 20 quid. And uh, they went, oh, that's, that's, that's Eddie Hearn. He's got, he's the one with a Bentley outside. I was like, I'll go back over to him. Went over, called him tight, got 50 quid out of him. Then just pestered him, basically. He gave me his business card, just pestered him that night. Wouldn't leave him alone. I was like an annoying little you know, little kid who 14 years old. Yeah, you know? yeah. And at, at that point, you're just, I think, well, not everyone, but I was impressionable by money. Like, I wanted to do well. I wanted to be mm -hmm. successful. I wanted to be a stockbroker back then. Really? Because like, yeah, I thought that was the way you go and buy a Ferrari, you know, Essex boy. You come rich. You go, yeah, yeah. you go and work at Canary Wolf yeah. and <laughs> do what they all did there. But I was never really, not like a mad sports fan, is the mm -hmm. reality, is that, the truth you use that one of the biggest sports promotional companies yeah, in the world but. yeah <laughs> but i think sometimes taking a step back away from it makes it easier to make the right decisions yeah you know you you see so many people in positions who are like fans of things and it's hard to make a, dis a good decision when you're a mad avid fan of that thing mm -hmm. because you make decisions based on oh, i love this or i love that fire or i love this and it's like you can't do that you have to make the right calls so for me it was about I knew whatever I whatever I do, I wanted to just work hard, mm -hmm. and I knew I wanted to be a you know make a success, and it really it was all about money. So I met a guy. I thought oh, I'm going to go and get a job with him, and I, no reason why. Just I wanted to drive his Bentley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I pestered him for months and months and months, and eventually he said, "Come and do some work experience." We used to do a lot of, like televised poker, and I used to run for the poker players. So basically, go and get their coffees, teas, pizzas, whatever. Yeah. And I made so much money because they'd all give me like 50 pound tips. Really? Yeah, like it was great. It was I mean, the richest 14 year old in Essex, It mate. was great. Eddie was like, how much are they paying you? I, <laughs> I, I think he wanted a share of it, yeah. to be honest. But that was really the start. And I just, it was 14 years old, 15 years old. I did that. And then when I finished school, I remember emailing him and saying, I want to come and speak to you. I want to, you know, I want to come and work for you. And he was like, look, you're 16 years old. I don't, I don't really think we got anything for you mm -hmm. and I was like look well if you don't want me I'll go somewhere else so you know make your call and I think he, he saw something then that he went oh god we'll give him a go and uh I, I've been there what, coming up to it's my 15th year full-time 17 Mad. 17 years since I met him and it's been it's been a great journey and a great ride and like had a lot of fun mm -hmm. and it's just getting you know it's getting better and better but they gave me the opportunities throughout the years and you know i messed up a few times and uh, but i've done all right frank i was going to say right for for you your whole life all you've known really then is matrim especially as your working life and even work experience do you feel like there's ever times you do you ever look back and go oh could have done something else or I would have liked to have tried something different. Is it ed ever anything like that? Or is it just like, nope, happy where I am and it's just tunnel vision and keep going forward? I think I we're lucky because we do 10, 11 different sports. We do like 400 events a year. So when I started, I worked across all different things, you know, whether it was the darts, the, the pool, the Moscone Cup, you know, like everything we did, I was sort of sent to, not, not to do anything serious, just yeah. make people tea. Mm -hmm. But I got to experience all these things and understand how they all work. 
I don't think I've ever, when someone gives you an opportunity like Eddie and Barry gave me, I'm, I'm like a very loyal person. I, I don't, wouldn't look elsewhere at anything. I love it to bits and it's a family business. And although it's not my business, I treat it like it's my business, like every penny's my penny. Yeah. You know, and I've always had that. And I would have had that whether it was with them or who, you know, if I started. And I was going to ask you that because I see it in interviews, even the way Eddie talks about you. We all know Eddie's a wind up and you two have a lot of banter and it's funny and it's this and that. But it's like he talks about you like you're part of the family. You can see it's reciprocated. Like I've even heard him say, I'm not going to be like some of these other boys at the uh, one that Frank Smith is going to be doing all the press conferences he's going to be doing all this. Like, like he's passing the baton over to you. Mm. Do you feel like a sense of pressure, or like a big sense of responsibility with that? Not really. I think the big thing between Eddie and I, we're just completely different people. Mm. Like as in everyone compares me to him and says, he's, you know, he's just trying to be Eddie Hearn. I'm, I'm not like, I, I'm very good at what I do and he's very good at what he does. Like if you asked me five years ago, do you want to do a load of interviews and become, the fact I'd go, no, not really. I'm not really bothered about it now. Mm. I don't don't go out of my way to be there. And But you can't beat Eddie at what he does. Yeah. So, like, people have said to me, why don't you do it on your own? I'm like, because as a pair, like, basically, Eddie goes out there and he's the best at what he does. He's the best salesman in the world. Mm. You can't beat him. There's no promoter in boxing better than him. And there won't be for a long, long time. I think he's unrivaled and unmatched. And then he turns around and he goes, good luck. And it's like, go and deliver it and it's been that way for years and i think because he's he's like a big brother yeah. like we like i'm the only one who will sort of stand up to him because i've known him since i was 14 years old so and it, you don't pay people around you just to go yeah okay yeah okay you know most people would like that but i've always had that relationship where i can be open and honest and it's kind of like you go out and sell it and come up with the ideas he comes up with a million ideas and i'm like oh my goodness <laughs> <laughs> it's got just wanted that. a quiet weekend um but he yeah, as a pairing i don't think you know it's unrivaled because i i'm very good at what i do and i like focusing it so many people now want to be experts of everything Mm -hmm. And I'm quite content with just doing what I'm good at. Like, I like Excel spreadsheets. They're, they're, they're the things that get me up in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> it's got to be the most exciting sentence oh, ever no, said no. on a fighter's life. You never, you never hear anything quite like it. Yeah. Um, with, with you and Eddie, I'm in, like interested in the dynamic, right? I, everyone takes the mick out of me, right? Because I'm a, a bit of a boxing nerd in terms of, I love, I love the sport and I love watching the fights, but I feel like it's not just me. I feel like it's the fans in general I want to know, in your opinion, why do you think boxing fans are the way they are? Because there's not many other sports where it's as imperative to hear from Frank Smith as it is AJ. Like, you know, you, you want to hear everything a promoter's got to say, how a deal's done, what the split is, what that manager said, why they swapped trainers. It's like it's like a it's like a soap opera. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's crazy. It's like following, say from following Towie or something after yeah. time. Do you know what I mean? And why do you think that is in boxing? I don't know. It's quite interesting that people are so involved in the business and everyone's an expert as well. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone knows everything. Oh, I should have done this and the splits this and the money in the pots this. I look at Twitter. To be honest, I try not to go on Twitter, Twitter too much because it's just everyone is an expert yeah. and you don't know what you're doing basically. <laughs> yeah, like, I worked yeah. in it for 16 years. I go on my YouTube, like I, I like reading YouTube comments of interviews I do because it makes me cry with laughter. It's like, who's this clueless little shit? <laughs> Want to be Eddie Hearn? I'm like, oh, you know, but I don't know. I think it's good because it means the sport, you know, it's one of the highest, I think, discussed topics on social media in terms of sport oh, really? outside of football, but um, not just boxing, but MMA as well, and like mm -hmm. and combat sports is one of the like is a huge discussion point. And I think it's good. I think it, you know, it's good that people are so invested in it. I mean, it's tiring after a while because you think bloody hell, but it's all part of the soap opera, isn't it? Yeah. And it has been for years. And I think promoters and this is where Eddie's so good. He doesn't take anyone anything too seriously. Yeah, like it's all part of the show, yeah. and a lot of the older lot involved are like get wound up about it. Mm -hmm. But we're we're very much if we can get a deal done, whether we get on or we have a joke or wind people up, if it makes sense and it makes sense for the fighters, then we'll do it. Um, but look, I think it's good that people feel they know every detail because you know it, it means there's someone to replace me when I go off into the sunset. <laughs> there's always going to be someone there. Exactly. Why do you think? For you, Frank, like specifically about you, why do you think you fit in so well with matching? Because even though you said, right, uh, you know, 14 years old, 
I started pestering this guy because that's what I wanted to do. And, you know, I saw his car. There's not a lot of 14-year-olds with that initiative, with that drive, forward thinking that much. Most 14-year-olds, especially now, do you know what I mean? They would have been, they would have been there. They would have sold enough raffles to go and buy a vape and then run down the park. Like that's, that's, <laughs> that would have been it. Do you know what I mean? Whereas you, it was a very different idea, very different plan. What made you that way? Like, are your mum and dad quite business orientated? Like, how did you get to there? I think, yeah, my family have always had their uh, own businesses. My granddad did, my dad, my stepdad. And I think I always wanted to, whatever it was, I knew I wanted to work hard. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, like when I was I don't know, 12 years old, my stepdad was a car dealer. And I used to get the key rings from the cars he bought. And I used to sell the key rings on eBay and then post them from my dad's office for free. So I used to make a couple of hundred quid a month selling car key rings. Wow. That was, that was like when I was 12 years old. I remember as well when my stepdad used to come home from work and I used to print off cars for him to buy from Auto Trader. And I remember back then he used to be like, yeah, oh mate, I had a long day. And I used to think, come on, I'm trying to help you. Yeah, yeah. But now when I think about people talking to me about my work, when I'm not at work, I'm like, leave me alone. Please, please don't, don't, don't talk about to yeah. me about boxing. <laughs> um, but I think I always had that drive and whatever it was, whether it was this or something else, I knew I wanted to just work hard. And I think, I think it's, it's a generation thing. Like the, the world's changing a lot. I think now, like we're probably the last sort of age group where it's like, go out and get things done. Yeah. I think people who are in their twenties now, it's not generalizing everyone, but it's, social media is not good for people mm. in a sense of you see things, but you don't see what goes in to get get that just see results yeah, right. yeah. and because no one posts bad times or hard times or how i got to this point and also you see a lot of fake things that aren't real and, and there's a lot of comparisons to the next person so i think you know for me it was always about i was always driven to work hard whatever it was like honestly whatever it was and I, i'm i'm still the same now like as i was back then i will do the smallest most menial job you know i still make tea in the office for people yeah, yeah. You know, i still go out and buy people like like that's just I don't like seeing people change when they do well. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, whatever I would have gone into, it would have been the same mentality. You said it earlier, you touched on it, you said, you know, the opportunity Barry and Eddie gave you and you made mistakes along the way and this and that. And on social media, we don't see the hard parts. Has there been a moment that sticks out for you where either like a mistake where you went, oh shit, I've really, I've messed this one up. Or <laughs> the smile probably said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there been times like that? Yeah, there was, I mean, the early days, I've, I've been working there for two months. I was, so I was 16, just left school and I was away filming that we were filming a poker tournament and basically a 16 year old in the evenings, you thought I'm one of the boys, like, I'm going to stay out with all the boys and see if I can get served a pint. And, you know, <laughs> I ended up staying out until, I don't know, four in the morning and I was sharing a room with one of the other guys we worked with and the alarm went off. But we thought it was someone prank calling the room at 8 a.m. Because we thought we haven't had enough sleep. We've only been asleep, <laughs> which we had only been asleep about three or four hours. So rather than waking up, he just unplugged all the phones in the room. We went back to sleep, woke up two hours later to about 40 missed calls from Eddie. I just burst out crying. <laughs> he was a bit <laughs> older. He's like, what's wrong with you, mate? I've done it a million times. And I was like, burst out crying. And I remember driving to the, to the studio. And I was like, I just couldn't. I was in pieces. And then... I got there and they, they put me on some other job. I was like logging the cards of this, like in the studio. Eddie walks in behind me and just drops a letter down. And I open it and it's a final warning. And I just start crying. Really? And he's like, there's nothing there. And I, and, I, <laughs> and I think, obviously you don't realise then, but he took a, ch the business was very different back then. This was 15 years ago. We were still a big business, but not, not where scale. we are now. Yeah, yeah. So he was like, I've taken a chance on you. You've been here two months and you're taking the piss. Mm -hmm. I think that was the first moment. I remember driving home, ringing my mum, and she was like, she went mental to me. She was like, someone's given you an opportunity and you've taken the piss. And ever since then, I've never done any, not, I've made mistakes, as we all do, we make mistakes every day. But, you know, I've never done anything purposely, you know, or, or like, I've never been late for work again, but that was a, I think that, that really set the tone for the rest of the time. I'm still on that final warning. Yeah, if really? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, if I, if I do anything later. wrong, anything wrong now, they can get rid of me in seconds. I do think it's uh, mad because when I, I read Eddie's book, right, and like I said, I'm a, I'm a fan of uh, the way business is done in boxing. And it's, it's just super interesting to, to watch it. And you hear about how people get to where they are, which is why you're here, right? It's an interesting story. Do you see, obviously he's not like a dad, it's more like a big brother, but when I when I read the way that 
Barry's and Eddie's dynamic was like full to him from the jump. Doesn't matter how old you are, I'm on your case. A lot, a, like a lot of bosses, maybe, and this may be why they're not as successful as Matchroom. A lot of bosses would have gone, 16 year old kid, he's having a laugh. I probably would have walked in and gone, cheeky sod, and that would have been the end of it. But for you, it was final, final Done. warning, no messing about. Do you think that that served you well? Yeah. And I think on the other hand, in the, the hard times like that, they also gave me opportunities that they didn't have to do. And that's what helped me grow. Like I remember going into Barry's office multiple occasions. He'd be like, right, go and sell the international TV rights when I was 19 or 20. Or 20. And I'd be like, what does that mean? Yeah. Oh, I haven't got a clue. And I'd walk out of there all nervous. Like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing. But they gave me, they actually gave me opportunities in so many businesses. You don't get that. I mean, where it all started, I used to sit in Barry's office cold calling people trying to sell them tickets to the darts so when barry wasn't there eddie used to put me there with like a list of 100 phone like literally cold calling like and it started off like hello hello my name is frank from matru you know they'd be like put the phone down that's right and just doing that hundreds and hundreds of time and that thing of rejection of people going no thanks mate yeah i'm not interested like some 16 year old shaky voice down (laughs) the phone and that's where it all kicked off but yeah it was always it, it it's not it's a lovely place to work. It's a family business, but it's very much results driven. Mm-hmm. And you make mistakes, that's fine, but learn from them. And that's and that's sometimes, you know, in these big corporate businesses, it's not it's not the same. Where you've got that, the people there who actually are making the decisions and they're saying, right, go off, go and do that. It, it's a nice it's a nice place to work. And that's why it's a nice environment mm-hmm. even now, as, as big as we are. It's still got that same feel. You can come in and walk in and sit down with the chairman of the company of this huge business and anyone in our outfit, you know, got 150 people now across all our sports can go in and sit and have a chat with them. And that's what makes it nice because, mm. you know, you could go and work in a, one of these big organisations with eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 employees, but the reality is you don't really mean a lot. Yeah. And, that, and that's hard. That's hard, you know, and that's why I think that's what's got me to where I am is being given the opportunities throughout. Mm-hmm. And even when you make mistakes, go, don't worry, learn from it on to the next one yeah so it's uh no it's 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 a great place to to work and i've learned so much you know barry especially and then eddie um to work to where we are now it's a weird one right because even when i speak to you from a when we when we're just chatting in general and we're having a laugh or whatever it's like oh yeah frank's like almost like one of the boys he's my age this and that when you sit down i watch you on like a press conference or in an interview or discussing business you sound light years ahead right you sound like you've got everything figured out and personality wise even in comparison to someone like eddie or whatever you seem super just like super chill yeah i'm sort of on a i'm always on that same level yeah but like it's funny because i get compared to eddie like i said earlier but eddie was started when he was 29 30. Right, so he was doing these interviews 29, 30 years old. Mm. I get compared to him at 30 years old where he is now. now yeah. And people go, he's useless. And like the only way you learn in these things is actually by doing it mm-hmm. and you get better and better. It's funny, my missus goes, you're so boring. <laughs> like, she watches In, in, in her defence, right, you did say the thing that gets me up in the morning. He's Excel Excel I know. <laughs> but if you know, like, if you know me, like when I'm out, away, like I'm... I'm not saying I'm hilarious, but I'm quite funny. Like, <laughs> I'm quite dry. Like I'm quite yeah, a laugh yeah. and I'm like happy. But when I sit down, because it's quite, you know, everything you say is recorded and it's going to be there forever. Yeah. So it's kind of like a bit safety first. She goes to me, she watches it, goes, so dull. I'm like, oh, thanks very much. It means yeah. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but Cheers. Cheers but that. it's, uh, yeah, that, that's the thing is, it's, it's just the learning process, isn't it? And, you only get better doing these sort of things. Like mm-hmm. if I did this 10 years ago, I'd be a shaking wreck. I'd be yeah, like, oh, yeah. but you just get used to it over time. But get having that constant comparison to Eddie is the one where it's like, well, watch his interviews when he was, tw- I wind him up all the time. Cause I come out of press conferences when I do press conferences and Eddie goes to me, what, what was that? Oh, you know, shake. I'm <laughs> yeah. like, you know, but because he's so good at it and he's yeah, done it yeah. for 14 years and now I'm just, learning and you know getting better and better or maybe worse and worse who knows yeah no it's better and better who knows knows? knows? you mean you mentioned your missus there emily right how how is that because obviously she's well i mean i don't know i'm assuming she's not like part of the boxing scene but she's part of one of uk's boxing most famous families Mm. right that must be a bit of a weird one because that that has got to be one of the most common questions that i as soon as as i said i was i was going to be chatting to you and interviewing here and i thought i was like everyone's like 
why doesn't Frank work with Chris? Why doesn't Frank do this? What a, that must be a question you get an untold amount, surely. Mm. Well, she knows more about boxing than me. She, <laughs> yeah. I mean, she also knows more about the business of boxing now. She's like, I know everything. She's like, I sit, <laughs> I've sat and listened to you for the last seven years, yeah. nearly every phone call. She's like, I know everything about the business. I go and do it myself. I'm like, good luck. Um, but it's always a fine line between family and business. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a tough one. I... I think she, she like being around me. She knows how good we are at what we do. Yeah, you know, and and she knows um, everything our business is based on is around honesty, trust, and transparency. Yeah. It has been for the last forty years since it started, and it's carried the whole way through. I think you know, working. There's obviously been periods with you know Eddie and Eubank Senior have had their moments. Yeah. Is, I, I try and steer clear now of the boxing. Yeah, like how the fine awkward line. is that for you in those situations? Because I know sometimes you're like, oh, I've seen interviews, you're like, oh, I'm not going to give my opinion. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, no. Yeah. But is it actually, do you guys have a, an understanding of that's work, this is family done, or can it actually blur lines sometimes and get awkward? Maybe in the past, maybe in the past it didn't, but I think the more time you spend together, you realise actually it's not really beneficial to blur the lines of the family and the business. Yeah. Um, you know, the situation last year, you know, when we were doing Eubank Ben. I mean, I spent four months, three months maybe with Callis Owland trying to make that happen. And obviously I'm on both, you know, like yeah, I, yeah. I've got, I'm at home talking to Caller about things and then talking to Connor about things, about the fight. And then Emily's over there and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, can't yeah, say that. You yeah, know, <laughs> things that you'd normally say. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> I've got to be careful here. But I think, yeah, over time you just... Uh, you realise actually it's quite sensible to separate the two. And, you know, my relationship with Chris Senior, I think we have differing views mm -hmm. on the business of boxing. You know, there's no one who can, and I've said this before to him, there's no one who can tell a boxer better how to be an entertainer. He was like the original, wasn't yeah. he? And if he, was a, if he was boxing today, could you imagine how big he'd be Ridiculous. with social media, yeah, with everything yeah. around it? And then there's a separation between understanding the sport of boxing. Like, I don't sit here and profess to be an expert about he should have threw his jab there or he should like I'm not that guy. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to be that guy. That's why they got trainers. Yeah, yeah. I'm the guy who can go and put on a show, make everyone enjoy it and go home and go perfect, great night, and everyone hopefully makes a load of money. Yeah. So it's always been I always say to him, like, you're the expert at the boxing side but I work in the business day in, day out mm -hmm. and understand everything that go, every detail that goes into it. But yeah, I think, like I say, over time you realise try and separate the two is the best way. Is is Emily quite like you in that way? Because you do, like I said, you're so like, just chill. I feel like you could be sat here now broker, brokering the next deal with the zone or just having a chat with me and you and it would just be, it would just be quite chill. Is she fairly similar like that as well? Because yeah. I look at, you see like Chris Jr, for example, He's quite uh, eccentric in certain ways, like some of the things he says. He's, but, but he, again, he's also quite... Like, I imagine you guys sat around at Christmas can be just quite like, hey, everyone. There was three do. words said. Yeah. <laughs> do you know, my, one thing I'll say about Emily is I wouldn't have done very well with... A, like, she's the perfect personality because nothing impresses her. Really? Like, nothing. Like, so, you know, sometimes you go home and go, I've done this. And she's like... <laughs> Yeah. A bit, bit of credit, yeah. babe. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. there's nothing like. Don't get me wrong. She says I'm proud of you, but mm. she's very, she's great for me because I think I'd be an arsehole <laughs> if I didn't. Have, do you <laughs> yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like when I was probably 23, 24 before I was with her, or like just starting, to, I was probably a bit of an idiot because mm. you think, oh, like look, I just done an event at Wembley, and you think you're the man, and actually, you know, different. Like, why are yeah, you any yeah. different? And she's been great at keeping me just completely flat line of. And I think you, have, in terms of my personality, you have so many up and down moments in boxing. That it's quite easy just to stay on a flat line level of things are good, right? Things are bad. They're going to be bad. They're going to be good. Like, and it's quite easy just to stay on that level and just, you know, deal with things. Mm -hmm. And there's not many things now that we haven't been through in terms of from a bad side. Yeah. You know, yeah, we've yeah. seen a lot of it now where you, where you look back and you go, look at that thing we dealt with. Look at this we dealt with here. And it's, you just get used to it. And I think, you know, it's quite easy to get excited and go, look at what we've done here. You know, mm -hmm. I could look back at when we did Frotch Groves and think it was never going to get bigger than that. Mm -hmm. But for us, it's all about not being complacent. So that's why I'm constantly like that. Cause it's like, right, another day, another we day. go out and do the exact same thing, just better. You know? Yeah. So I was going to say, um, I normally ask, like, what's been your, your biggest, biggest highlight in boxing or biggest highlight in life or 
when I when I read this, correct me if I'm wrong, Frank. CEO in 2018. Yeah. So yeah. when I was 26, mate. How does that? Because Matrim by this point, you know, because you know, you sort of really saw the uptake. Matrim was obviously always doing bits, but from like the way I kind of market for some reason in my head, you're going to tell me I'm wrong. You know the actual figures. That AJ Dillian White fight in the 2015 onwards, it just seemed to just go, blah, 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 blah. it just blew. Even yeah. obviously it was already like gaining, but it just got bigger and bigger and bigger mm -hmm. and bigger. To be made CEO of something that that huge, was it pure happiness? Was it a pure highlight? Or did you just think, shit? I think it's just next step net. Like I sort of, you take it as you go along and it's like, it's exciting for a day and you go, oh my God, I'm CEO. But actually it doesn't really make any difference. Yeah. And it's like, for me, I just always want to keep improving. I don't care about really title. I don't care. You know, the thing of what people think, you look on the internet, people say he doesn't know what he's doing, this, that, the other. And I'm not like a, I'm not a competitive person. I haven't got any ego whatsoever. I just want to get things done and I want to do it at the highest level and I want to keep being successful. So for me, it's just been like a constant ride of just like another year and look at what we did here. But you never really probably don't embrace it enough to go, wow, look at what we did in 2021. Look at what we did in 2022. Wow, look, we broke the attendance record in Dallas with Canelo, Billy Joe Saunders, like some Essex boys going over to America, <laughs> you know, that people said we're never going to do anything in boxing in the US. Yeah. You know, so there's so many of those moments, but it's, it's probably the thing of not getting complacent that makes you not think you've done well, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Because as soon as you go, we're the best, like, I believe we're the best at what we do. I believe no one comes close to us at what we do, but there's going to be periods where people come in, there's competitors, there's new people coming in with money, this, that, the other, and you just have to keep evolving and keep growing. So you don't really look back and go, well, we've completed it because you never completed it. Yeah. There's always going to be something bigger and better. And that's the, been the same every year. And, um, you know, for me personally, I just, I just enjoy the ride. I'm lucky to do something where I get to travel the world, get to meet so many interesting people. And it's every day. Every yeah. day there's yeah. moments where you go, like, it's hard for me to pinpoint something and go, that was a moment. Because it's like every day things happen that you go, I can't believe it. Like, I'm just from, I'm a fat kid from Romford <laughs> who's like living a dream, really. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not like, a, like I said, I'm not a mad sports fan. I never was. I like putting on shows, I like putting on events and I'm lucky I'm in a world where people are very interested in it and you get to meet interesting people and you get to just do crazy things that you never thought, never thought you'd do. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that's the fun for me and that's what keeps it new. And, you know, every show we do, we do 40 boxing shows a year. Every show we do, I go to every show around the world, whether, you know, this year I've done 56 flights in six Jesus. months. Jesus. And for me, what keeps us going is we get to walk out every weekend and go, this isn't good enough, or this is really good. Mm -hmm. And every weekend you get that drive to go on to the next one and go, right, we need to improve this, that, the other. And we've never lost that yeah. in the last, you know. And I always say, Eddie always says it since he joined, it got really big. I always say since I joined, it got really big. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, that, that's the drive that keeps us going. It's just that constant improvement yeah. in, in what we do. I mean, like, from a matchroom perspective, of course, you guys are super driven and a company is always flourishing and doing bigger and better things. But I suppose on a personal level, is there any times where, because, you know, Ed, I've heard Eddie speak about it before, but like I keep going back to it. Your personality seems quite, you know, not might, might not be massively up, might not be massively down, but you appreciate either one and it's, mm. either way is going to pass, right? But is there any days where you do wake up or there are moments where you're just like, I just, I, I don't want to do this? I'm sure that, yeah, I'm sure there are, but I'm quite like, again, I drive my missus mental because I wake up in the morning, I'm like, hello, how are you? And she's like, just let me wake up. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but you go, you get used to going to sleep in boxing, there's a problem, and waking up in boxing, there's a new problem, mm -hmm. especially when we're doing 400 fights a year across 40 shows. Like, it's non-stop issues, yeah. really. But the highs are so high. Like, the good moments are so good that you sort of just get used to it. And there's nothing, like I say, we've been through so many tough moments that, you know, whether it was Jarrell Miller failing a drugs test yeah. and a month before AJ's debut in America and it's a huge event sold out in Madison Square Garden, you're standing there going, 
got a month to go and, you know, mm-hmm. or whether it's, you know, when we did AJ Ruiz in Saudi and you walk out and the venue, you've got four months and you're looking around going, where are we going to do this? Yeah. Um, you know, whether it's the Conor Ben situation and all those tough times, COVID, yeah. no one had ever experienced anything like it. There was nothing to point to, to go, this is what you do in this situation. So you get so used to the tough times that actually the good parts of it and the moments where you can just go, look at what we did here, look at what we did there, sort of balances it out. The highs are much higher than the lows. When you you, you touched on some of the situations there, so, okay, you got obviously uh, the Conor Ben situation, um, you've got, uh, like you said, AJ losing, losing to Ruiz, the U6 situations, whatever, right? There's times where I suppose for Matchroom, as a company, you go... That's that's not ideal. We see we all see the interviews, right? I guess they, this technically is another what this is another interview for you guys, and that, that's the hard part. Like whenever I watch podcasts or this or that, or you watch the the quicker format interviews on like boxing social, whatever, you start to feel like you get to know people, right? Like there'll be a lot of people, even myself. Like I will speak to you, even when I saw you just before we started this. I will speak to you, Frank, like I know you because I feel like I do know you because I watch you speak all the time. I feel like I know how you would handle. Like if someone said. Oh, pick three answers. There's three answers here. What one would Frank say? You feel like you go, oh, probably that one because you see, <laughs> yeah, do you know what I mean? You, yeah. People feel like they get to know you, right? I'm so curious to, as to like, what is it actually like behind the scenes? So like, you're back, you're back at Matchroom HQ. The Conor Ben situation's going on. What actually is it? Because you know, like, how how do you guys approach it? How, what do you do? What even is the conversation? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, every day is different. And at the same time, we're quite, except we're still learning as well every day. We're not the masters of it. You know, like the Conor Ben situation. I'm sure there's things we could have done differently yeah. over that period of time. But it's very easy for people on the internet to say, you should have done X, Y, Z, or this, that, the other, without any info. You know, when you've got, when you're playing out a scenario, you know, in front of you live, it's very easy to say, you should have done this. Yeah. You know. Right, I, I, and I'm sure, but I'm sure I'm guilty of saying, oh, "Why haven't they done that? Why haven't they done that?" And like, you don't know the info. I think we're we're still as big of as big of a business as we are. We're still a small business in terms of the way decisions are made. You know, it's very much like sit in a room, go right, what we're going to do here, and we we're very nimble. You have to be flexible in boxing. You have to move quickly, and um, you know that that's where our like my relationship with Eddie is good because we don't always have the same views. And we can look at things from different angles and I can give my view. It doesn't mean, you know, it's, it, it's, he sort of lets me get him, get on with running the day to day of the business, mm-hmm. you know, and that that's great because, you know, I, I like doing it. It's good fun. But I think we're, like I say, we're so as big as we are, we're still small and we still make decisions, you know, not always right, but no one's always going to make every decision right, but we learn from it. And I think it's it's difficult because you're judged on everything yeah. you do because it's such a you know forward facing business. Like you say, something goes wrong, there's cameras there. You got to go and do an interview about it. Yeah, and what well, you're saying that, on the yeah. spot as well. And what you say in that moment? Yeah, that's it. People hold that against yeah. you. The amount of times I've seen it, people go, "Yeah, but you said this, you yeah. said yeah. that." Yeah, and yeah. you said this five years ago. Mm. Yeah, I did, but it's changed. Yeah, yeah. Like my opinions change. Like, what do you want me to? Ever lots of people's opinions change. But they got point back to well, you did this, you said this. I'm I'm much more sort of guarded in what I say. Like I'm much more the corporate one, probably. Yeah. The other two yeah, of us. Yeah. Eddie's very much on his, you know, and that that's why he is where he is, you know. But I think that's probably the toughest bit is your like you say you're asked a question on the spot and right there, and it's not scripted. Mm-hmm. But you know, we we don't sit there and go, you can't ask us questions about this. We can't talk about this and have pre-prepared statements but yeah yeah that's not it's, off the it's just me it's just me going or eddie and then people go you yeah, it just says the same thing as it well of course i do yeah. you want me to say something that, like, <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> you disagree with him yeah, sometimes i disagree i disagree on opinion like if you ask him about x fight and you ask me about this fight i'm not going to say the same thing mm-hmm. but if you ask us the questions where there's an answer to it we will probably say the same thing yeah but yeah it, it's tough because everything you say is there forever mm. you know mm. Is there, is there anything weird about it if you, like you said, anything you say there forever, everyone documents it, everyone chats about it. Every, I feel like I'll watch one interview, I'll watch an interview that goes up two hours later and the, the, the interview's already taking questions from what they said to go, you said this earlier and they're throwing it back at you. Something I've always found curious, I want to know if it does ever get your back up, right, is 
people knowing so well, let me rephrase that people thinking they know so much about the business and then that does kind of bleed into almost becoming almost like official news like i remember so uh, obviously canelo canelo is it with pbc he signed? Yeah. so he signed that what, free fight deal whatever it is and you know i'll, I'll be listening to talks what we're listening to whatever and it's like huge blow to match him and just like you know I, between this and aj losing to Usyk, and i'm we're just not sure if this is gonna you know how much longer matchroom's got it and then before this narrative is built that like you guys are now in dire trouble does that kind of stuff ever bother you or is it just nut down we crack on yeah i think it's like you said nut down crack on and get on with it because i believe like i said earlier no one comes close to us at what we do no one will have the work ethic like that i personally have eddie has and the team we have around us because we you know we want to keep being successful we never look back and go well we did all this so let's just mm. let someone else win now you know i'm not competitive but i'm competitive with myself of i don't leave any stone unturned in anything we do so if you listen too much to what people say on social media don't get me wrong they're the fans you have to take certain things in but other things it's like how many times have we been in a position where someone loses oh they're finished yeah they're finished they're finished and then you come back and you do this you come like look of course we wouldn't like we would prefer to have kept canelo alvarez yes he's the one of the biggest stars in the sport and you know we had a tremendous working relationship with him but we delivered seven of his last eight fights i think it was or six yeah. of his last seven fights you know we've had some great moments he's been great for the business and now it's about right what do we do we go to work and we repl not replace him but you bring in other great fights and our business is about 52 weeks of the year just c consistently delivering big nights it's not a one-off you know we're not a one-trick pony we've been doing it for like at this level for time. 10 11 12 years you know and we'll continue to do it and you know working on the schedule currently for the end of the year there's some tremendous fights being lined up and it's non-stop and no one else is doing it on the back-to-back -back level of right one week we're in mexico one week we're in monaco one week one week we might be in asia one week we might be in the middle east then we're in london then you're in manchester then you're in new york then you're in mm -hmm. Vegas, and it's back to back to back um so i don't spend too much time focusing on these narratives yeah that are pushed because it's just like it comes and goes does that take a toll on you frank being in so many places all the time constantly working like obviously you're a very driven individual it's kind of it seems like you know there's some people who who work to live and there's other people who like live to work and they love what they do you feel it feels like you fall into that category right like you love doing what you do of course like you have your own life but this is a big part of it being in like 56 fights in the last six months different country here problem there going to sleep another problem solving this solving that i know you kind of take it a day at a time but where do you see yourself in 30 years how how does that do you know what i mean like, is that how you is that how you envision the rest of your life no no in all honesty i don't want to be in boxing at 50 years old like these people angry like bitter annoyed like i want to leave on my own terms and go do you know what look at what we did over the last 25 years i've sort of worked hard from an early age so i don't have to do it when i'm 50 odd years old i also can't like, you can't do it for 25 30 years you can't get on 120 flights a year yeah. be all over the plate it's just not it's not healthy so i think if you if if i said would i be doing it in 30 years i'd probably be dead <laughs> is, is it true but i'm like i'm quite sad in a way and it's I wouldn't be happy if I wasn't doing what I did. Whether it was this, like again, I say, whether it was this business or something else, I wouldn't be happy if I didn't commit myself to it because I don't want to look back in 10 years and go, do you know what? You could have tried a bit harder. Yeah. I want to go, I gave it everything. And you're not always going to win. It's not always going to be, you're not always going to get the, you know, do the biggest show that year. Someone else might do it. Mm -hmm. But it's that consistency thing and saying, I gave it, my, gave it everything. And yeah, I'm lucky to do something where, as much as it's hard work, the rewards on the other side, the great times, the moments where you go, I can't quite put it like I'm here. Look at me, I'm here. Like I'm like I say again, I'm. I just thought, I I don't know what I was going to do, but look at what I'm doing today. So you know, it's I'm driven by that, and it's probably a bit sad in some ways because it consumes your life and you lose other things by doing it. Yeah, you know, like I don't spend enough time with my family. Yeah, I don't probably don't give my missus enough like attention mm -hmm. but at the same time if i didn't do what i was doing i wouldn't be happy anyway so it would sort of be 
and I, it wouldn't be beneficial anyway if no. I gave my spend more time with my family because I'd yeah. probably be a grumpy, <laughs> yeah, be miserable, yeah, yeah. miserable <laughs> bloke. And the time I do spend with them, I enjoy it. It might be five or six days a year I get to see you know a few of my family, mm. but so be it. And I want to do that, and they know that they they appreciate that without doing what I do, I wouldn't be happy. Another thing I was curious about, right, for you guys, obviously you work with so many different people and normally it's like, I don't know, oh, Oscar De La Hoya said this or someone said that. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, has you, have you ever been in a sticky situation when it comes to fighters? Because fighters, especially on fight week, I know for a lot of people, like, yeah, they're going to get in the ring and the a press conference, but for a lot of them in that week, that like getting in that mindset, it's real, right? And it's like, I think of a random situation. So like, okay, cool. So you've got AJ, who's your guy. And you, obviously you guys have promoted nearly all of Dillian's fights, right? But technically, I suppose technically, contractually, he's not your guy, mm. right? There's situations like, I don't know, Chisora throwing tables. Like, you know, you just find yourself, have you ever been in a sticky situation when you thought, oh, Eddie, what do, we, what do we do here? Quite a few, quite a few, but you just get used to it. And a lot of it is dealing in that heat of the moment is, you mm. know, things go on and you just have to sort of get through it. I think where we've always been good as a business, we, although we're first and foremost, yeah, boxing is our business, but we're an events business. We put on shows, and we quite we like to make it comfortable for opponents. You want people to come back, you want people to work with you, and you want people to enjoy it. Yeah. So we don't always have that sort of that sort of feeling of animosity between us and opponents a lot of the time. Yeah. Sometimes promoters, but at the same time, it's a lot of the time in boxing. A lot of people don't get on with each other. Yeah. But the reality is, if if you can get something done and it makes sense for everyone, and it doesn't always take the the characters that fall out. Like Eddie and Oscar, not the best of friends. But if we want to get a deal done with Golden Boy, there's other people at Golden Boy we work with, you know. So it's it's all part of the show. It will always be there. I think fighters, you have to deal with them a certain way, especially in fight week. But I'm always quite straight up with the people we work with. I'm like, um, reality. Yeah, whether you like to hear it or not, I'm just going to say that's it, the yeah. yeah, because like I'm not trying to hide away from anything. Mm -hmm. And again, you don't pay us, or we're not, or we're not around you just to be yes men. Mm -hmm. You're not always going to like to hear it, but we'll tell you the truth. Yeah, has there ever been a? So that's the fighters. In terms of an event, have you ever really took a punt on something and like really gone, whether it like you personally or you know as a as a business, really gone, this is going to work. And it just really hasn't worked. I remember Eddie, for example, talking about the Lomachenko situation when he when you brought him over to fight Luke Campbell, and he was like, "This is going to work. This is going to work." And it just really financially didn't quite work out how you guys had hoped. Has there been anything that's, like that? Yeah. That's one where we completely disagreed, actually. Really? Yeah, because yeah, I was like, it. It was after I think that was after AJ had lost against Ruiz. Really? Was that recent? Yeah. Yeah, and I think that was one. This it was nine twenty nineteen. I think we did that. Was he so, in the O two? Yeah, so we did that fight at the O2. And there was an opportunity to do it in the U. You know, obviously Lomachenko was champion, big deal with top rank to, for Luke to go and do it there. And I think that was one that was driven by, maybe wrongly, the people saying, oh, look at Matchroom, AJ's lost. And it's like, right, we need to do something big here. We're actually, we're perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. like, and I remember we were very much on two opposite you know, ends there. And I was like, that nah, I think is a terrible idea. I think we should do it in the US. And we did it in the O2. Didn't go very well. Why did Why did you think it was a terrible idea? Because as big of a fighter as Lomachenko is, there's a captive audience of people who are actually like super boxing fans, hardcores, you know, that are gonna tune in for it. And I just th I thought it was too much of a risk. Um, but look, we make decisions every day that sometimes wrong, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes right. And uh, there's been a load along the way. I I, I don't. I don't really look, I don't really sit there and go, that was my decision. It's just a group as a group. And if we make a wrong decision together, we make it together. And if it doesn't go well, it doesn't go well. And if it goes well, we all, you know, we're all happy. Um, and that's the way, you know, you don't really want competition internally. You want everyone really put, pulling in the same direction. And like I say, they're not all going to go well, but there's going to be a lot that do. In terms of fighters that have sort of changed the game, I would say obviously, AJ, I don't, I get called an AJ fanboy, right? I don't think he get, forget, forget his actual fights, right? Whether you rate him or don't, which I think you're stupid if you don't, you know, two-time heavyweight champion for a reason, but whatever. Do you think he gets enough credit for changing the game the way he did? No, no. And I, I think 
he deserves credit from fighters as well because he's you know, I'm not saying he's given them the opportunity. Obviously, they've worked hard as well. But for the sport to be in the position it is and why it's as big as it is, especially in the UK, he's a big part of that, you know, and he he's he doesn't get credit and he's never going to get the reality is he's never going to get the credit he deserves. Mm -hmm. It's just the truth. Um, but and, you know, he still wants to keep evolving, growing and developing. You know, this isn't this is just another part of the story. He's had, he's had losses, but he's going to come back from them stronger. Um, but, yeah, I don't think he gets enough credit in the sport. You know, there was the there was the era of sort of like the Frotch Grove, Frotch against Groves mm -hmm. years. You know, when we came back in, Kel Brook against Matthew Hatton, those sort of nights that really kicked kicked it back off, Frotch yeah. against Butte. But, yeah, I think AJ is the one who really... You know, yeah, really I, deserves I, more. I try to when I try and give it like a to like summarize it. I say like if I walk down the street and I say I talk about any fighter, right? I feel like there will be quite a few fighters who their merit is based purely in their wins and losses, right? With AJ, I said this when when he had those defeats to to Usyk. If I bring up my little sister now and say AJ's fighting. She couldn't care if he she if he lost five, ten, fifteen times. It's Anthony Joshua. She's gonna she's gonna tune in, and I feel like for people, I mean, I would say I'm relatively quite a hardcore fan, and I, I'm sure there's there's a lot of boxing fans out there who follow the sport closely, but I still think it's hard for us to even understand what it is that he did. Does that mean that you know you can attribute a lot of it? So I'm, I'm I guess the question is, on kind of like a a businessy kind of side and understanding it internally. What difference did you see that AJ really made? Because I, I can't put my finger on it. I just know that from what I could literally see, the sport got bigger, the, the purses got bigger. Everything just seemed to grow as AJ grew. And I, I don't understand why it followed him so closely. It sort of tracked with him. Yeah, yeah. I think, look, off the back of the London Olympics in 2012 as well, that was an amazing time for boxing in that Olympics. Some tremendous fighters came out of there. I think AJ had the perfect formula. You know, six foot seven, good looking, <laughs> heavyweight, and he was knocking people out. And we were taking him all around the country and building his profile. And he, look, he's a perfect role model as well. You know, like uh, he, he's he's not out there talking rubbish about people. You know, there's other people in the sport that that have done, but he's, you know, I think he, I think he just changed the dynamic of the sport. You saw those huge nights he had at you know the stadium selling out, sort of. Cardiff, Wembley, then he went to New York, sold out there, then Saudi, you know, he, he really, it's hard, like, it's the same thing, it's hard to pinpoint it, and there's not, they don't come around very often, mm -hmm. you know, there's not, there's probably not going to be someone on the scale of AJ in the next couple of years, maybe, maybe in another five years, someone might come along, um, and it's like Floyd Mayweather, yeah. there's no one sort of close to what Floyd Mayweather did in the US, then there's, you got Canelo, there's no one else really close to Canelo. You know, you've got other people on the fray, like pay-per-view fighters. But um, I think the key is he deserves a lot of credit. He's never going to get it Yeah, from boxing fans. And there, so many people in boxing, it's wider than just being a good boxer. Yeah, There's so many good boxers out there, or great boxers, or great fighters. I look at like Andre Ward, for example. When he was an active day fighter, unbelievable, wasn't he? He was pound for pound, like probably mm -hmm. up. But he didn't really get to where he should have done yeah. because he didn't have the rest of the package. And AJ really had that whole package. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can be a great fighter, but also it's probably the vulnerability as well. You know, of eight, like, as yeah. in the losses as well. Because Floyd Mayweather, to me, I don't understand why Floyd Mayweather is so big, personally. Really? Because yeah. his fights, like... But I think you've hit. I think you've hit the nail on the head there, Frank. I don't think it, it, it is his fights. Mm. It's the talk of unbeaten record and then yeah. everything around it. Like yeah. the guy walks around, literally spoke like he was a god. Do you know yeah. what I mean? I think yeah. people kind of bought into that and that but, flashy. You know, whether they hate people. it or love it, they sort of buy into it, right? I do think talking about AJ and that dynamic there and commercially, I think it's hilarious that as mainstream as he is, and obviously I know he went through a lot of mental health fights and stuff like that. But Tyson Fury, I would say, is literally the direct opposite to Anthony Joshua in right? the every way, right? And I do think, even if, I'm sure AJ probably has admitted it and probably would, I don't see Tyson Fury ever admitting it and going, yeah, I agree. I think they are, as much as they are rivals, but they've never even stepped in the ring together, are amazing for each other in this era because they are so opposite. Do you see yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And they kind of, they have this parallel. Do you think, honestly, they will ever meet? I do, I do. I think, you know, AJ's obviously got focus on August 12th. 
then we want to make the Deontay Wilder fight. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah, I believe it. I believe it's too big not to happen. Yeah, is the is the truth. Um, massive fight. AJ against Deontay Wilder is a massive fight as well. Huge, fight. you know. Um, and one thing you can't say about AJ's never ducked anyone. Like when it when it was the Usyk stuff, right? Mm-hmm. It was, Usyk was mandatory. Everyone's like, he's gonna he's gonna vacate. He's gonna vacate. He's gonna vacate. Hey, Usyk's too good. He's gonna vacate. Didn't vacate. Full Usyk lost. Right? He lost against pound for pound. I would say top one, two, three today mm-hmm. active fighters. And everyone's in like ah oh, useless. But we said he was unbelievable and he was going to vacate. You don't commend him for taking the chat. So, like, he'll never he'll never get the credit there. But a, what I'm trying to say is AJ will never shy away from any challenge. And he always wants to keep bettering himself. Hence why he's gone out to the US to train. Yeah. You know, look, the guy's done very well. You know, it's clear to see he's, he's, he's made a load of money. But he always wants to better himself. And it would be quite easy just to go, I'm just going to train in London, you know, live a lifestyle. He's he, All he cares about is improving at boxing. And you know, I think, I think he's he he wants all those fights. He wants all the big fights. He's not going to shy away from any of them. He never has. You know, everyone can have that again. All these Twitter experts can have their opinions on. Oh yeah, but he didn't make it on this date when it got offered to you. Like, fine, but you don't know the detail. Mm-hmm. I don't know any of the detail around it. Just look at the the challenges he's consistently took. He's always stepped up to the plate, and will continue to do so. But yeah, I do I do think it will happen. So. AJ obviously he's had a few different trainers. He had the he had the UC, Obviously, we see him beat uh, Jermaine Franklin. Do you do you think going back to at the time when he he took on Usyk for the first time, underestimated sounds like a too strong of a term. Do you think AJ and the team thought the fight would be easier than it was, or do you think they expected exactly how it was? I think it's easy to sort of say you should have done this, you should have done that, you should have done this. You when you've got someone opposite you who is so good at what they do, like you can, I could tell you, Oh, you should have knocked him out. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, but you would, yeah. I would love to have done that, you know, <laughs> yeah. but it's, it's, it's easy to say where someone else can improve when you don't know the other person is so good at what they do. Mm-hmm. Like Usyk's such a good boxer. Yeah. Amazing. And you can do everything, but he might just be better than you that night. You know, so I don't think it's a case of underestimating him. I think everyone knew how good he was. I think the best man won. Yeah. And I think you saw improvements in the next fight. It was a closer fight the second time around in Saudi. But again, Usyk, pound for pound, top one, two, three. There's no shame in losing against him. You know, and I don't believe Tyson Fury really wants to fight Alexander Usyk, is the, is the truth, in my opinion. I don't think it's as a foregone conclusion as some people think. I think it is. And I think... Fury knows that. I think it's a very tough fight for anyone. I mean, it's Usyk. Do you know what I mean? It's a very, very yeah. tough fight. Um, this dialing down towards the end, right, Frank? So this kind of will link into my last question: Is there any times, right? So obviously, after after the uh, second Usyk fight with AJ, you know, there's the there was the sort of the reaction in the ring and what happened there. There was times when you know he was in a press conference, and people were like, "Why? Why are you?" Why are you doing this now? And he's like, money, right? Or going a bit more controversial, there'll be things that Billy Joe Saunders have said, or a fighter you're representing and they've said something. Is there moments where you go, but like, I'm going to have to be the one to clean it up? Like someone said something, you've gone, shit. I think in the heat of the moment where things are going on, it's quite easy for someone, again, like we are saying about when we get asked questions live and you, you have to make a, call, a judgment call in your head of what you're answering to this you know, this question, you might not even know the answer. Yeah. You might, you might just be saying something, but I think it's hard, you know, for fighters, I'll always sit there and say, if someone's wrong, Mm -hmm. but if I think they're wrong, no, I don't, you know, it shouldn't have said this or shouldn't have said, but you know, they're, they're special individuals who, you know, sometimes just got out the ring and had a 12 round tear up. And then you're expecting their, you know, their, their thoughts there and then straight after, maybe you're going to say something that, you don't mean or maybe you're going to say something that you shouldn't say so i'm sure there's moments where it's like oh my goodness why have they said that <laughs> but it's very easy for pe- again people to judge mm-hmm. without actually being in that position yeah is the you know is the truth yeah yeah so kind of dialing down then in regards to match moving forward do you guys it of course there's always fresh talent we're seeing new people come through this and that it feels like we've had or we're currently in right near the end of it such an era do you, do you, do you know what i'm trying to say 
do is there anyone to you where you could go these are maybe not the next stage specifically like you said we might not get those next ones straight away but as we start to see even like Chisora going the way Dillian White going all these sort of obviously the, they're all heavyweights but all these sort of names fading off into retirement and then the next batch coming through is there any fighters you look at and you go yeah these are the ones that we're going to be we've got to keep an eye on in a positive way yeah look I think like, we promote just over a hundred fighters. You know, we've got a huge stable of fighters. We're always looking at new up and coming talent. And you know, the reality is you might sign 10 young fighters and one will make it really big mm -hmm. and nine might fall away. Yeah. And that's the sport we're in. It's a tough sport. Um, you know, I look at, there's, there's huge fight, you know, you say about like AJ, there's huge fights still to be made there, as we say, with the likes of the Wilder fights, with the Fury fights. You know, Usyk rematches that. There's still huge fights to be made in the heavyweight division there. You know, Conor Ben, We'll be back soon. I think he's a huge star in the sport. Yeah. You know, there's massive fights against the winner of Liam Smith, Chris Eubank Jr. There's a big fight against Kel Brook there. You know, Josh Taylor, Jack Cattrall is a massive fight we'd like to make. Um, Diego Pacheco is a future superstar, we believe, 23 years old. Yeah. We've worked with him since he's 18 years old. There's so much, so much talent out there. You know, we've just signed a great crop of Olympians in the likes of Peter McGrail, uh, Galau Yafai, you know, and, and so many tremendous fighters that we're invested in. Dalton Smith, another one, had a massive knockout performance. So many names. I'm going to miss someone out who's yeah, going to yeah, be yeah, upset yeah, that yeah, I didn't yeah. say them. But so many stars, and it's our job to build them and replace them. And, you know, we've been through these moments, haven't we, where people say, oh, think back to DeGale retiring, Groves, Froch, that mm -hmm. sort of time period where it was like those guys, Bellew retiring. You always find new people coming through. It might not be obvious today, you know, because I look back at Tony Bellew when he fought Danny McIntosh at, at, Echo, yeah. at the Echo Arena and we sold 957 tickets. Did I think that Tony Bellew would go on to become a pay-per-view star, you know, selling huge numbers in his last three or four fights? No. Mm -hmm. Or selling 20-odd thousand at Everton? No. Yeah. Like, uh, that's uh, the truth. Like, do you know, in the last 18 months, for example, someone that's really shot me is like, like Lee Wood, for example. Mm. Like, what, what was that? Was that in fight camp when he beat Kanzu? Yeah, beat Kanzu. And, and, and then for, out of nowhere, now it's like... <laughs> Warren potentially this yeah. happening. Laura obviously had the loss yeah. with Laura, but to come back and wins the title again, I see exactly what you mean. Out of nowhere, almost yeah. within one card, you could sort of set a new dynamic of more people moving forward and going on. Yeah, but um, also another one is like O'Hara Davis, a guy we don't promote, right? Who would have said when he lost to Josh Taylor eight years ago, got his record payday? Would I have said that Josh Taylor, uh, O'Hara Davis, is going to go on to become mandatory for the world title and possibly fight Ryan Garcia for a load of money? No. Right, yeah, like, that, that trajectory, you yeah, never yeah. imagined it, right? So, so that's why there's constant excitement because you don't know what's around the corner. Mm -hmm. And someone you think might be the next superstar maybe doesn't make it. Mm -hmm. But someone else who you think, well, you know, sort of coasting along could be in three or four years' time. And that's the, that's the fun part about it. Last, last question, because I'm imagining by this point, statements all out, everything's really happy. Connor Ben, as opposed to, it's all positive now, you know, been cleared by UCAD. It's all positive news. Excuse the pun, not positive, but you know what I mean? It's all, it's all good news. Yeah, heading, obviously, everyone's going to be asking fight dates, this, this, and that. I'm curious from a sort of perception point of view, how quickly, because I've got to say, there have been fighters who I suppose are technically bigger, right? Like um, Tyson Fury, Canelo, who've had their sort of brush with failing tests, right? But I don't think there's been a story anywhere near as big or as covered or as controversial or as, as anything as, as Conor Ben, right? It's been a lot for him to handle, you know, in the past, however long. Do you think this is it's going to be tricky now moving forward with him in his career as opposed to other, because a lot of other people say, okay, they might've had a foul test, been in this. It was all kept quite quiet. There was a hearing, whatever happened within a few months, people kind of like, you might get the few, like we say, the, the hardcores, you might send the, the, the go, oh, you're on that beef to Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, to, to Canelo. They might send that in. But in terms of, um, something being very mainstream, Conor Benz is taking it to the next level. So do you think promoting him now, there's always going to be that perception there where other people it's kind of faded off a bit. Do you think it's going to be difficult to promote him now? I don't think it's going to be difficult to promote him. I mean, uh, look, he's been cleared. He's he's done everything that people ask of him. He went mm. down the route of, you know, went down the route of UCAD and National Anti-Doping Association uh, and that was dealt with. Yeah. And, uh, and he's cleared to fight in the UK now. Um, there's always going to be people on social media who have a predetermined view of him, of mm -hmm. course, just like a number of other people 
you know, uh, who continuously years ago this has happened to, as you as you said, and they will always have that view of him. That's that's the reality. I think that's <coughs> that's the piece he has to get used to. Yeah. You know, and he look, he's grown up a lot. He's a twenty six year old. Like the things he's been through in the last ten months, mm -hmm. you wouldn't wish on anyone at twenty six years old, you know, mm -hmm. any age. But like, uh, so he's a young, young yeah. family, all that exactly. Kind of stuff. And he's grown up. Uh, he's grown up an awful lot. And like I say, he's always going to be have people who have a, a view of him. Mm -hmm. That's just the truth. That's never going to change because everyone's an expert and everyone knows everything and everyone knows all the answers and. What he's done, he's gone out there and he's done everything people have asked him and he's gone to the people who are specialists within this field and he's cleared to box. Mm -hmm. What more would you like him to do? Yeah, that, and, that, he's, that, and he's him. really, man, he, I don't know, I don't know many fighters who, obviously Connor's lucky he had the resources there, but also that being said, who would have the grit to like really just fight this? Because it could have, it would, could have been easier for him to go, I want to take a ban, like mm -hmm. say this, take it, take a lighter thing, get through it and then just come back. You know, it probably would have caused him a lot less stress. Yeah, and yeah. a lot less ag and saved him a lot of money to be yeah. blunt but he, he obviously believed in it and he fought for it um well listen uh, frank best of luck to connor obviously best of luck to match with everything that you guys do obviously you're going to carry on smashing it but uh, thank you for being on a fighter's life bro i hope you had a good time thanks for having me thanks, it was good bro. mate i'm looking forward to the next one